Hi, this is the first in a series of my probability videos. This first video will give you the basics of probability. The topics we will cover are approaches and definitions, including sample space and events, the probability of an event A and B both occurring, and we'll look at the special case of independent events, the probability of event A or event B occurring, and we'll look at the special case of mutually exclusive events, We'll look at this formula here where the probability of A occurring plus the probability of A not occurring is equal to 100%. In other words, either A occurs or it does not. We'll look at conditional probability and do a quick introduction to Bayes' formula. And finally, we will look at the Monty Hall problem. There are several approaches to probability, including the subjective, experimental, and classical approach. The subjective is one based on intuition, which you probably use all the time, and in fact, I just did. It's when you say things like, that probably will happen, or that probably or is not likely to happen. Um, the problem with subjective is sometimes our intuition is wrong, and we will find, we will do some examples where our intuition does not necessarily serve us well. The next approach is the experimental approach, and this works well for things that we could repeatedly do over and over, such as maybe something at a roulette wheel. An experiment we can run repeated times, and then we can have statistics and say whether or not things are statistically probable. But not everything can be run as an experiment over and over. And then we have the classical approach, which is what we will be using in this video. In the classical approach, the probability of an event occurring is the number of ways an event can occur divided by the total number of possible outcomes. We have these two definitions that will help us visualize this definition of probability. The first one is sample space. That is the set of all possible outcomes. The event is the subset of the sample space. We will illustrate this with an example. Our first example is rolling a six-sided die, where our sample space is a roll of one, a roll of two, a roll of three, a roll of four, five, or six. These are all possible outcomes of one roll. Once we have our sample space, we can define events as subsets of our sample space. We might define event one as six. In other words, the die roll becoming a six. And then the probability of that event would be there's one possible way of getting six out of six possible outcomes. We might define event two as rolling a two or a three. So there are two ways for that to occur, that is a roll of two or a roll of three out of six possible outcomes. So the probability is two over six. Next, we will look at the probability of an event A and an event B both occurring. To do this, we will use the multiplication rule, and we will start with independent events because that's the easier case. And that is the chance that two independent events, event one and event two, both occur is the probability event one occurs times the probability event two occurs. One thing I often do is make sure I associate with the multiplication rule the word and. So and goes with multiplication. If you want event one and event two to occur, you need to multiply. And now I will appeal to your intuition to give you a way to, mem to remember how to associate the word and with the multiplication rule. So if you want event one and event two to occur, let's say event one is winning the lottery and event two is winning a Nobel Prize then the probability of event of winning the lottery and winning a Nobel Prize should be smaller than the probability of just winning the lottery or just winning the Nobel Prize. So you want to multiply because when you multiply these two numbers, you'll get a smaller number because remember, the probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. So the probability of two events occurring should be smaller than the probability of just one event occurring. And that's why you want to remember you multiply those probabilities to get a smaller number. And there's also this very nice compact notation, probability of event A and B occurring is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. I had mentioned that this rule here, this multiplication rule we are using, is for independent events. So we should talk about what it means to be independent. 
So for two events to be independent, information about the results of event one should not affect the probability assignment of event two. An example of dependent events would be if event one was the chance of rain. And if I could ask you, what do you think the probability is of rain? You might give me an answer for event one. But then if I went ahead and told you, oh, but there's also uh, not a cloud in the sky, you might change then your probability assessment of event one because event one would be dependent on event two. On the other hand, if you told me the probability of rain and then I gave you event two, that there were storm clouds coming again, that would be two dependent events because you would probably update and make your chance, your forecast of rain more favorable. So for dependent events, the probability of A and B both occurring equals to the probability of A times the probability of B given, that's what this bar means, that we know A has occurred. This sign here also indicates uh, something we called conditional probability because this means the probability of B on the condition that A has occurred. And this probability that A and B have both occurred is also equal to the probability of B times the probability of A given B has occurred. This formula is just a special case of this general formula because for independent events, the probability of B given A, well, information about A doesn't change our probability of B, so this is just equal to the probability of B. And this here is our multiplication rule. If we want the probability of A and B both occurring, that's equal to the probability of A times the probability of B for independent events. And for general events, the probability of A and B both occurring is the probability of A times the probability of A given B, which is equal to the probability of B times the probability of A given B. We will do an example to illustrate the multiplication rule, and we'll do the very typical example of drawing two tags from a box containing four red and two white tags. So let R1 be the event a red tag is drawn first, and R2 be the event a red tag is drawn second. What is the probability of R1 and R2 both occurring? A good question to ask, is this drawing with replacement or without replacement? Let's consider without replacement first. That is, once we draw a tag, we hang on to it, and then we draw a second tag. So after we draw our first tags, there's only five tags remaining to draw from. This is an example of dependent events. Since our probability of drawing a tag, a red tag on our second try, depends on what happens on our first draw. Because without taking into account what happens on the first draw, we would normally say we have a 4 in 6 chance of drawing a red tag. But now we know if the first draw is a red tag, then there's only 3 tags, red tags remaining, out of 5 possible tags. So we've changed our probability assessment. And now, according to our probability law for dependent events, the probability of drawing a red tag on the first try and a red tag on the second draw is equal to the probability of drawing a red tag on the first draw times the probability of drawing a red tag on the second draw given that we've drawn a red tag on the first draw. So this is going to become the probability of drawing a tag on the first draw. That's four out of six outcomes. And now the second draw, we have three tags left out of five possible tags. This is a very straightforward example, but I want to mention this for harder examples. So when you have dependent events, the outcome of your first event is going to change the sample space of your second event. What I mean by that, in this example here, we initially have four red tags, which I will label R1, R2, R3, R4 and two white tags, W1, W2. So this is our sample space. And initially, we would calculate the probability of drawing a red tag as four 
out of 6. However, once our first event occurs, if we draw a red tag and we hang on to it, our probability space has now changed. We only have three red tags and two white tags, so this is our new sample space. I have written that out here so you can remember for harder examples, you want to remember that for conditional probabilities, the first event changes the sample space for the second event. Another way of saying that is your first event creates a new sample space for the second event. Now we want to compare that to doing a drawing with replacement. That is, after we draw out a tag, we can see what it is, and then we put it back in the box so when we draw our second tag, we have our six tags to draw from. And this is an example of independent events because the box looks the same regardless of whether we draw a red tag first or a white tag first. Because these are independent events, the probability of drawing a red tag on the first drawing and a red tag on the second drawing is equal to the probability of drawing a red tag on the first drawing times the probability of drawing a red tag on the second drawing. And that would just be 4 sixth times 4 sixth because there are four red tags out of six tags when we first draw. And then whatever tag we get, we put back into the box. So we still have four red tags out of six red tags for our second drawing. And again, these are independent events because it really doesn't matter if we draw a red tag or a white tag in the first drawing. Our probability assessment for the second draw is always 4 sixth. We'll look at another example. So suppose there are 10 computers, one of which is defective. Four students make a random selection in succession on an equally likely basis from any of the remaining computers. What is the probability the four selected are all good? We are going to let the G sub i event be the event that the ith computer selected is good. So if the first uh, student, they do a G1, that's the probability the first student selects a good computer. So what we're looking for is the probability that the first student selects a good computer, the second student selects a good computer, and the third and the fourth student also select a good computer. So that's G1, G2, G3, and G4. And this is a dependent probability because if I am the last person to select my computer, if all three people before me have selected good computers, then I have, um, there's seven computers left, and one of which is defective. So I have a six and seven chance of selecting a good computer. However, if any of the other three students had selected the defective computer, then I have a 100% probability of getting a good computer. So again, my probability of choosing a good computer is totally dependent on what has happened on the first three selections. So the probability that G1, G2, G3, and G4, all four students select good computers, is equal to the probability of G1 times the probability of G2 given G1 times the probability of G3 given G1 and G2 times the probability of G4 given G1, G2, and G3. So each time someone selects a computer, they change the probability, the sample space, for the next person choosing their computer. So our final answer is the probability of G1 is 9 out of 10 because there are 9 good computers out of 10, but once that computer is taken away, there's only 8 good computers to choose from out of 9. And then for the third person, there's only seven good computers out of eight to choose from. And for the last person, there's only six good computers out of seven to choose from. So this is our final answer. Now I'm going to ask the question, what is the probability the defective computer is selected? The hard way to do this is to do this by cases, which I will do for you in a minute. The easy way to do this is 100% minus the probability all that are chosen are good. In other words, 100% minus the 9 tenths, 8 ninths, 7 eighths, and 6 sevenths. The hard way to do this is to list out all the ways you can get a bad computer. So maybe it's the first student, the second student, you can, um, and there's also the third student and the fourth, which I did not show. But the uh, probability then of the first computer being bad is 1 out of 10, 
and then the probability of the second, third, and fourth students getting good computers is just one because there are no other bad computers. The probability that the second person gets the bad computer is the probability the first person gets a good computer, which is 9 and 10, times the probability of the second person getting a bad computer. So that's one chance, and there's nine computers left. And then the other two people, they are guaranteed to get a good, good computer. So you do the calculations for the four ways someone can get a bad computer, and then you add them up. That's using the sum rule, which we haven't yet discussed. One more example of the multiplication rule, and by the way, the addition rule is much shorter. This one's kind of tricky. So if you know a man has two children and one child is a son, this is important. You don't know if this one child is the older or younger child. What is the probability he has two sons? This is where it is important to look at the sample space. For the two children, this right here is the sample space. The first child could be a girl and the second child could be a girl. Or it could be the first child is a girl and the second child is a boy. Or it could be the first child is a boy and the second child is a girl. Or it could be that both children are boys. It is not correct to say the sample space is girl, 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 boy, and boy, boy. And in fact, this chart here that includes the four possibilities captures your intuitive sense that it is more likely that he has one of each. And this chart captures the reason why it's more likely he has one of each, because it is because one of each can occur two different ways, that the first child is a girl and the second child is a boy, and it can also occur by having a boy first and a girl second. But now that I have told you that one child is a boy, we have limited our sample space to these three possibilities. So what we are looking for is the probability of this event in this sample space, that is one in three. That's the probability of having a boy given there is at least one boy. What we have just covered is the probability of event A and probability of event B both occurring, and that's equal to the probability of event A times the probability of event B given the event A has occurred, which is also equal to the probability of B times the probability of A given the event B has occurred. In the special case of independent events, probability of A and B both occurring is equal to the probability of A times the probability of A given B. However, this is the same thing as the probability of B since A gives us no information about B. Our next topic is about the probability of an event A or an event B occurring. We will use the addition rule for the OR, the event 1 or event 2. And that's the chance of 1 or 2. And in this case, we're going to start with mutually exclusive events occur is equal to the probability of event 1 plus the probability of event 2. Another notation that's more condensed is probability of A or B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B for mutually exclusive events. And here is the definition of mutually exclusive events. If two events are mutually exclusive, that means only one of the events can occur. That is, the occurrence of one event excludes or prevents the other from occurring. The general form for the probability of A or event B occurring is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B occurring. And you might notice it is the same as this one here for mutually exclusive events because for mutually exclusive events, the probability of both events occurring is equal to zero. We will do an example to illustrate that and we'll come back to our dice, but we'll, we will roll two dice this time. When looking at the roll of two die, I really like to put this in matrix form where here I have the cases where the first die is a 1, and then the second die is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The first die is a 2, and the second die is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. So here you have all 36 possibilities for the roll of 2 die. The first thing that's easy to see is when die sum to a number. Here you have the diagonal, 
where the die rolls sum to 2. Here is the diagonal where the die rolls sum to 3. And here are all the other sums, the diagonals that sum to 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. I really recommend when you are practicing that you have this chart available or that you're able to recreate it pretty quickly. It's actually really not that hard and very quick. So the question is, what is the probability that the sum of the two dice is either 3 or 7? So here it is written symbolically. The probability of 3 or 7 is equal to the probability of 3 plus the probability of 7. And since these are two mutually exclusive events, summing to 3 is mutually exclusive from summing to 7, um, we can use this form of the equation. And we can see from our table, to sum to 3, there are two ways that it can occur. That's 2 out of the 36 possibilities. And the number of ways to sum to 7, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 ways to sum to 7, and that's 6 out of 36 ways. So our final answer is uh, 2 nights is the probability that we sum to 3 or we sum to 7. The next problem, what is the probability the two dice sum to 7 or the first die roll is a 4? Again, we look at our table and we find these six ways to sum to 7. So we have the probability of summing to 7 as 1 sixth. Next, we find these six ways where the first die roll is a 4. So we have the probability of the first die roll is a 4 is again 1 sixth. Sorry, this should be 36. If we just added these two probabilities together, we would get an answer of 1 third. If we compare that to counting all the uh, possible ways we can have sum to 7 or first die rolls of 4, we would count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and we've already counted the 4, 3, 9, 10, 11. So that would be 11 over 36 ways that one of the event or the other occurs. And you can see that 11 out of 36 is not equal to one third. So we can't just use this formula in particular because there is an element for 3 that satisfies both the fact that it sums to 7 and the first element is a 4. So these two events are not mutually exclusive. The sum to 7 is not mutually exclusive where the first drive roll is a 4. So we need to use this formula here. The probability of summing to 7 or the first die roll being a 4 is the probability that it sums to 7 plus the probability the first die roll is a 4 minus the probability that both events occur. Now we have 1 sixth plus 1 sixth minus 1 thirty-sixth, which is equal to 11 thirty-sixth, which is the same as what we got when we just counted all the elements. I wanted to leave you, in addition to the die roll, information about uh, coin tosses. So here are the different outcomes for two coins tossed. You have heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and tails, tails. And it's important you realize that the heads, tails is considered different from the tails, heads. In other words, order is important. And intuitively, you would expect that getting one of each, one head and one tail, is more likely than heads, heads, tails, tails, which is why um, intuitively you might think that these two will be different. And statistically, this is also, it bears this out, that heads, tails is considered a different result than tails, heads. To go on to get the different possibilities for three coin tosses, the easiest way to do this is take this line for the two coin tosses and put a heads in front of each of the results. And then for the next line, put a tails in front of each of these results. And you will see there are two to the third, in other words, eight possible results, because there are two possible results for each coin flip, and there are three coin flips. So there are eight possible results. You can also think of this as counting in binary if you'd like. So you can list this where um, H are the zeros and the T's are the ones. This is zero, 
this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, and this is 4 in binary, 5, 6, and 7 in binary. We have just worked on the probability of A occurring or event B occurring, and that's equal to the probability of A plus probability of B minus the probability of A and B both occurring. And the reason why we have to do this subtraction is because we don't want to double count when, probability, when A and B both occur together. We had the special case of mutually exclusive events where probability of A or B occurring is the probability of A plus the probability of B, and we don't need to worry about subtracting out probability of A and B occurring because that probability is zero for mutually exclusive events. Remember, mutually, mutually exclusive events never occur together. I also want to mention this formula of the probability of A plus the probability of A not occurring is equal to 100%. There are times when this formula comes in useful when you want to calculate the probability of A, but for whatever reason, that might be difficult, but it is easier to calculate 100% minus the probability of A not occurring. We used that formula when we did this example problem with the 10 computers, one of which was defective. The four students are making random selections in succession of a computer on an equally likely basis. What's the probability the four selected are good? And we were able to compute that directly. First, uh, the first student would had a 9 in 10 chance of selecting a good one. The second student had an 8 out of the remaining 9 com good computers. And the third student had a 7 and 8. And the fourth student had a 6 and 7 chance of selecting a good computer. If we went ahead and asked what is the probability the defective computer is selected, well, we could go and calculate all the different cases where one of the computers is selected as the first choice, the second choice, the third, or the fourth, or we could simply do 100 minus the probability that only good ones are computed. So this would be the easy way to do this problem. Our next topic is conditional probability and Bayes formula. We'll do this using an example problem. A given test to determine if a chemical is carcinogenic is positive for carcinogenic chemicals 95% of the time. It scores negative for non-carcinogenic chemicals 94% of the time. That is, for non-carcinogenic chemicals, it has a 6% false positive. If 60 out of 10,060 chemicals are carcinogenic, what is the probability of the, chem the chemical being carcinogenic if it is tested positive? So first, we should organize our information. Let's let P equal a positive test and C equals a carcinogenic chemical. So we'll start with this uh, test is positive for carcinogenic chemicals 95% of the time. So the probability you get a positive test, given it's carcinogenic, is 95%. That's a 0.95. That means 5% of the time it does not test positive, even though it is carcinogenic. We also have that it scores negative for non-carcinogenic chemicals 94% of the time. That is, it scores negative when it's not carcinogenic 94% of the time. Which means when it's not carcinogenic, you get this false positive 6% of the time. What we are trying to find is the probability it is carcinogenic given it has tested as car carcinogenic. And we know from our conditional probabilities that the probability it is carcinogenic and test carcinogenic is the probability it is carcinogenic times the probability it will test carcinogenic given that it is carcinogenic. And these probabilities we have. The probability it is carcinogenic is 60 out of 10,060. So it's 60 out of 10,060 times the probability it is positive, given it's carcinogenic, is right here. So times 0 0.95. 
But what we want to find is P of C given P, but we also know that this here, P of C and P, is equal to P of probability of P and then probability of C given P. So all we need to do, and I say that a little bit sarcastically, is find the probability of a positive test. Once we know the probability of a positive test, then we can say the probability of carcinogenic given a positive test is equal to P of C and P divided by probability of a positive. So to give myself some space, I'm going to shrink everything down, oh, not that much, and kind of move it to up here on the side. So again, I need to start by calculating the probability of a positive test. And there are two ways that we can have a, a positive test. The first is if we have something carcinogenic. And then again, we get a positive test given it's carcinogenic. The other way, this is a plus, because we're using the uh, addition rule for um, mutually, mutually exclusive events. And the other possibility that's mutually exclusive is that it's not carcinogenic but we get a positive result given it's not carcinogenic. Again, here we're using our addition rule. And we're using the fact that we have mutually exclusive events, um, carcinogenic and not carcinogenic. And now we can plug in the numbers. The probability it's carcinogenic. Again, that's 60 out of 10,060. Keep messing that up. Probability it's um, going to test positive given it's carcinogenic is 0.95. Plus the probability it is not carcinogenic is this 1 minus 60 over 1060 times the probability it tests positive given it's not carcinogenic is 0 0.06. Then to finish this problem off, I'm going to say the probability it is both carcinogenic and test positive is equal to the probability it is a test positive times the probability it is carcinogenic given the fact that it tests positive, which means that the probability it is carcinogenic given it tests positive is equal to the probability it is both carcinogenic and test positive divided by the probability of test positive. And we have found um, this probability of test positive right here, and the probability it is both carcinogenic and test positive we found right over here. And I'm not going to uh, calculate all those numbers. We just looked at conditional probability and Bayes' formula. Bayes' formula comes from the conditional probability formula, probability of A and B is equal to probability of A times probability of B given A. We can use that to figure out a formula for probability of B given A, which is equal to probability of A and B divided by probability of A. Sometimes probability of A is not given to us explicitly, so we also need to keep this in mind that probability of A can occur possibly two ways, which is the probability of B occurs and the probability that B does not occur. And these two are mutually exclusive events. We use the addition rule probability this or this occurs. So if we have the probability B occurs, then we multiply times probability of A given B. If we're in the case that B has not occurred, we multiply times the probability of A given not B. And those are the different ways that A can occur. Sometimes in these problems, there's a lot to keep track of, and you have to figure out what's available and what's not and what to use. So they can get a little um, complicated, but it's actually very much based on this one idea of conditional probability. Our last topic is the Monty Hall problem. This last problem is a famous problem, I guess it's infamous, because a woman who reputedly has this really high IQ, I think her name was Marilyn Vosavant, I don't know if that was her real name, sounds kind of suspicious, but anyway, she had, uh, someone, a reader had asked her this question as someone who was supposed to be really smart, and she answered it, and she did answer it correctly, but her 
answer had gotten a lot of responses. She, she had written this in the newspaper, and a lot of people wrote back to say that she had gotten it wrong when she hadn't. But I'm going to give you this problem because it's infamous and also because it's interesting. The answer is yes, you should switch. To see why this is true, we should look at the sample space and kind of do a little graph and consider the different cases. Let's consider the case the car is behind door number one. There are three possible cases. One, you initially choose door number one. Two, you initially choose door number two. Or three, you initially choose door number three. So let's consider the case when you choose door number one. So you've chosen this door here, which has the car. Now Monty will show you either door number two or door number three, but let's just say he, for argument's sake, he shows you door number two, and then he asks you, do you want to switch? In this case, if you switch, you lose. If you don't switch, you win. We're assuming you don't want the goat, you want the car. We'll consider the same now for if you initially choose door number two. So door number two has the goat. So Monty is going to show you door number three because he never shows you the car. That would be too easy. So you have door number two, he shows you door number three, and he asks you, so you don't want door number three because you see it's a goat. So he asks you, do you want to switch to door number one? So in this case, if you switch, you win. If you don't switch, you lose. Last, we'll consider the case if you initially choose door number three, which has the goat. So Monty will show you door number two. Again, he's never going to show you the car. So then he asks you, do you want to switch? Here again, if you switch, you win. If you don't switch, you lose. So now we see if the car is behind door number one, we, when we switch, we lose once and we win twice. So we have an advantage when we switch because when we don't switch, we win only once. And a similar argument can be made if the car is behind door number two or three. This is an example of a problem where the intuition may work against you because you know he's not going to show you a car, but at the same time you figure you have a 50-50% chance of there being a car or a, a goat behind the door. But by doing this analysis here, you can see clearly that your strategy should be to switch doors. Another way to see this, maybe a little more intuitively, is you realize that you have a 1 in 3 chance of choosing the car, which means you have a 2 in 3 chance of choosing the goat initially. So 1 in 3 times when you choose the car, if you switch, you're going to lose. But 2 out of 3 times, you're going to choose the goat. So when you switch, because he's going to show you the goat, you're going to switch and win. So you're more likely to um, choose the goat, but then because he shows you the other goat, when you switch, all of a sudden you're more likely to win. And again, the moral of the story is that you want to look at your sample space. To summarize, what we have looked at are approaches to probability, and we looked at classical probability, we looked at definitions of the sample space and events, then we looked at how to calculate the probability of that A and B occur, and we have this conditional probability, probability of A is equal to probability of B given A, and we have the special case of independent events, where the probability of B given A is just the probability of B. We also looked at the probability event A or B occurs, which is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability A and B both occur, and we looked at the special case when the A and B cannot occur together and this would be equal to zero. And that's in the case of mutually exclusive events. We looked at using this formula here. Sometimes it's easier instead of calculating probability of A directly to do 100% minus the probability that A does not occur. We looked at Bayes' formula, which comes from conditional probability. So we used our conditional probability formula, which is the same over here and we solved for probability of B given A. And then I also mentioned that sometimes probability of A is not given explicitly, but we can, if we have A given B and A given not B, we can break that up into cases. 
a probability that B occurs, probability B does not occur. These are two mutually exclusive. And if we want to know the probability this or this occurs, we use our addition rule, and we have probability of A is equal to probability B times probability of A given B plus probability B does not occur times probability A given B has not occurred. Last, we looked at the Monty Hall problem, whose moral is if you're in a game show with cars and goats, you should switch. Thank you for listening, and good luck in probability.